I'm Bob, and I'm really glad to be with you. Thank you so much for having me today. And Aaron, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, in addition to being an ink-stained wretch, a, a guy who has written more words than anybody you've ever seen, I also work for nine radio stations and four television stations here in the Washington, Baltimore area. And the fact that I worked for those 13 places and never lasted at any of them more than three years tell you everything you need to know about the craziness of the electronic media. But I'm going to talk to you today about some of the craziness and some of the wonderfulness of the print media, particularly our wonderful morning newspaper, The Washington Post. Aaron, you showed me a little bit short because, yes, I have worked at The Washington Post for 36 years. I did 36 years full time on the staff, but I still work there. I do special assignments, and I'll tell you more about that near the end. First, let me put my coffee down. This is mother's milk for me. <laughs> People want to know, how in the world, Bob, did you write 5,411 columns on deadline without ever missing a deadline, without ever coming up dry? And the answer is coffee. <laughs> mother's milk. I'm going to talk today about the golden era at the Washington Post and uh, how I was lucky enough to be a part of it. But I want to begin with how I began, because I think that my job interview story, uh, <laughs> I've heard hundreds of them, and I would stack mine up against anybody's. The year was 1967, and I had done one full year as a cub reporter at a long dead newspaper in Albuquerque, New Mexico. That was my first job out of college. So I was sure I was ready for the big time, and I wrote a letter to the editor of the Washington Post. You remember letters with a stamp? Yeah. And I said, I want to come east for an interview, and he wrote back a letter with a stamp. And we made an appointment for a couple of Monday mornings out uh, at 9 a.m. Friday night comes around, and it's time to fly. And I'm driving around and around the parking lot of the Albuquerque airport, and I cannot find a place to park anywhere. Oh my god, my dreams are going to go up in smoke. Finally, I find a place to park. I got 10 minutes to make this flight. I'm running through the airport, and it occurs to me that I have nothing to read before five hours up there. Now, one thing Aaron did not tell you is that I have an almost lifelong relationship with the card game Bridge. I have almost 10,000 master points. I'm a national champion, a 31-time regional champion. I write about Bridge. I teach Bridge. Bridge and I go way, way back. So I duck into the newsstand of the Albuquerque Airport, and there it is, a book about Bridge. Better bidding in 30 days. You know, one of those junky books that they sell only in airport bookstores. So I bought it. Read it all the way east. Had a nice weekend in Washington. Show up right on time for my 9 a.m. Monday morning appointment. And for those of you who go way, way back in Washington, this is the old, old Washington Post building at 1515 L Street Northwest. You got me? Remember it? Remember the Pickley Hotel on the corner? Yeah? Wait, you <laughs> will talk. That was a long time ago. So I'm, I'm waiting in the, in the uh, elevator lobby. A young woman comes down to escort me upstairs, and she said, didn't they tell you he's not the editor of the Washington Post anymore? Over the weekend, President Johnson has named him the ambassador to the United Nations. And there's a new guy in the corner office, 9 a.m. Monday. He has absolutely no idea who I am. I have absolutely no idea who he is. We go upstairs. This guy sticks out his hand and says, Hi, I'm Ben Bradley. <laughs> All of you know that in just a few short years, Bradley will become the most famous newspaper editor in American history. I think the best in American history. And I hope that all of you, or most of you, have seen the film All the President's Men. Have you? The film about Watergate? 
I'm not a movie guy, folks, but Jason Robards Jr. in that film does the most perfect job of capturing Bradley, who was two people conjoined into one. He could be your playful, funny, best friend, hail fellow, well met, and then he could just flick it on and change into all business, just like that. So <laughs> we go into his office. How was your flight? How was your weekend? Oh, yeah, Albuquerque, blah, 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 blah. And then he flicks it on. And Bradley really did talk like this, a very gruff Bradley. He looked at me and he said, all right, what's the last book you read? Obviously, he wanted me to say David Copperfield or something like that. And I cannot tell you 57 years later why I decided to tell Bradley the truth. But I, I remember thinking, OK, all right. You had a nice weekend in Washington, Robert. And I looked him in the eye, and I said, better bidding in 30 days. He looked at me, you play bread? <laughs> yes, sir. You play well? I said, yeah, I got all these master he starts writing on a yellow pad, and I can't see what he's writing. He finishes, and he frisbees the pad at me. It hits me in the gut, and I look at the pad. There's a bridge hand written on the pad. <laughs> and Bradley informs me that he was playing with his wife the night before, and I'm looking at his wife's hand, and he opened the bidding with one club, and the next player passed. And do you believe she bid one time with that hand? Well, here with my entire life hanging in the balance, <laughs> uh, I too would have bid one diamond with that hand, but I, I read the room, and I said, oh no, sir, oh no, one heart would be a much better bid. Then I get 10 minutes of Bradley <laughs> reminiscing about how he used to fleece the suckers in the dorm at Harvard in the 10 cent a point bridge game. I think he thought I was fast Eddie or somebody, which I was not and am not. So I'm nodding. And I'm, finally, he stands up and sticks out his hand again and hires me on the spot. So I can go to my grave, I hope, in a very large number of years, being able to say that I truly was the first person hired by the legend himself, Benjamin Crown and Shield Brad. But it only went up and on from there. Uh, later during Watergate, I sat between Woodward and Bernstein throughout Watergate. I had a first name basis friendship with the amazing publisher of the Post, Catherine Graham. I was first name buddies with uh, some of the most legendary people who ever worked at the Post. The great Shirley Povich, the sports columnist, the amazing Herb Block, the editorial cartoonist. But when I started at the Post, the golden era hadn't started. In fact, the newspaper was not exactly the most reputable place in the whole world. I walked in there, I went back to Albuquerque, came back two weeks later to start. The first day I walked in, the first thing I saw right in the hallway leading into the newsroom was a stack of old newspapers about this high and there were cobwebs on them. Hmm. I'd been at the post about two hours, and a guy came up to me and said, if I ever wanted to place a bet on any sports event anywhere, he was the guy to see. A couple hours later, another guy comes up to me, and he does one of these, looks around, and he says, if you ever want a certain kind of female companionship, for a long time, or maybe a short time, I'm the guy to see. I said, my gosh, what did I get myself into here? But the real memory that I have was of the floor. The, the floor at the old Washington Post newsroom was covered with linoleum tiles. And it had these strange yellow streaks all over the place <clears throat> at odd angles. And I remember thinking, gee, they must have spent a lot of money on some abstract artist to design this, this wonderful web of art here. It took me a little while to realize that this was years of people dropping lit cigarette butts on the linoleum, and they would burn themselves out into yellow streaks. 
it's amazing that the fire marshal never showed up because if he had, I don't think I'd have a story to tell you. <clears throat> okay, that's how I got there. And as the post began to succeed and grow, it mirrored what all of you longtime residents of Lover Park and the Washington area will definitely remember, the huge growth in the population and the wealth of the Washington area in the 60s and 70s. Why? All of you remember why. President Johnson's uh, Great Society led to a ton of new programs, a ton of new spending, and a lot more government employees here. The war in Vietnam did it too. So those two forces particularly, but also the growth of the suburbs here for a lot of reasons. Uh, Jane and I, learned, I didn't even introduce Jane. I'm so terrible. My wife Jane over here, the conscience of our family, a woman who we, just before I met her did not live in Glover Park, but came close. She lived on T Street in Berlin. She still has a t-shirt to prove it that says T Street on it. We don't throw things away in our house. Anyway, Jane is going to be running the book sale, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a while. But the growth of the Washington area and the growth of the Washington Post went hand in hand. And none of it, though, would have happened without the great leadership of Ben Bradley and Catherine Graham and a lot of other people who got added to the staff very quickly. And there was a sense of excitement at the Post that uh, was just palpable. I remember in 1968, sitting in the office of Ben Bradley and having a private conversation with him about something. I don't even remember, probably a story that I was working on. And suddenly, some guy I didn't know burst in the office. Hey, hey Ben, uh, when do you want me in Saigon, Ben? And Bradley said, well, you better be there in a week. And the guy said, okay, okay, I'll be, I'll be there in a week, thanks. And he leaves. And Bradley tells me to wait a second. <laughs> and he gets on the phone. And all of you who doubt that there is a special relationship between a newspaper editor and a newspaper publisher, this relationship between these two people was remarkable. And I'll give you Bradley's side of the conversation because this is the one I heard. K is Benji. Hi, dear. Hi, honey. How you, do how you doing? Good. Okay. Okay, honey. Good, good, good. Listen, Kay. Listen, Kay. I got to do something, and I need you to say yes, Kay. You will, won't you, dear? Yes, yes, yes. I need another guy in Saigon in less than a month. I know. I know we got a budget, honey. I know. I know. It'll only cost a million dollars a year. I knew. Thank you, dear. I knew you would say, I knew you would say yes. Did you work for anybody like that? Did you work for a cooperation that would make a million dollar decision with one phone call with no preparation? I did. Okay, that's not all good, and the Post was not always the most disciplined place in the whole world, but it was exciting, it was growing, and a whole bunch of talent started to arrive. Two people who will belong to the ages were named Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. What they have done for the Washington Post reputation, for its bottom line, and for the world of journalism, I think stands the test of time. These two guys are going to be the two most famous reporters who've ever lived in a world of lots of reporters who deserve that honor. But I sat between them throughout Watergate. Typical great Washington Post management. I was not working on Watergate stories. I was sitting between these two guys. You would think they would have moved me out from in between them, but no, I was sitting. So they were working around the clock on Watergate. I was working on other things. And <laughs> this leads to my one regret uh, in my long career at the Washington Post, just one. I am not in the movie. <laughs> I should be, could be, ought to be, wanted to be, deserved to be in the movie. I had one line that I would have been great at in the movie, playing myself, of course. I would have won Best Supporting Actor. I know I would have. Here's how it happened. Every afternoon about 5 o'clock, 
squadrons of editors would arrive at our little pod to, to talk about the Watergate story for the next day. But what did Nixon say today, Woodward? What did John Mitchell say today, Carl? And they're hovering, hovering, hovering. Here's my one line. Lucky you. Here's the Academy Award performance. Turning slightly to my right. Would you guys please go somewhere else? I'm trying to get some work done here. <laughs> Thank you. They never listened, and neither did the Academy. And the movie is, it belongs to history, and so do those guys, and I do not. But, but, here's the good news. Well, first of all, get a grip, everybody. The Watergate break-in is now 52 years ago. Can you believe that? Wow. But there's gossip out in Hollywood that they're talking about a remake of All the President's Men. Are you ready for a 90-year-old Robert Redford? <laughs> I don't think I'm ready for that. But, but, it's my opportunity. <laughs> If I can't play myself in the remake, Brad Pitt can play me. <laughs> I think that'll work just fine. Woodward and Bernstein, as a lot of you know, uh, not only led to the most significant uh, series of stories that ever led to the resignation of a U.S. president, but they did it the right way. Bradley knew what the stakes were, and he insisted from the very beginning that every word that they wrote in the newspaper have two sources. Very often, daily journalism is lucky to have one source because the pace is so fast. And you know, it's not like writing a book. You can't stop and take your time and backtrack. You got to get it done. And particularly later, when Watergate became, became a competitive story, these guys were under pressure to produce fast. And there has never, I don't think, been a, a combination of Batman and Robin that was made up of two more unlikely people than Woodward and Bernstein. Let me tell you a little bit about these guys. Bob Woodward was the son of a Republican judge. He grew up in the North Shore suburbs of Chicago. His father insisted that his son do exactly what he had done, which was to go to Yale, to go into the United States Navy as a lieutenant, to serve his time, to go to Harvard Law School, to work for a big firm in downtown Chicago, and then become a judge in the suburbs. And Bob did the Yale part, and Bob did the Navy part, and one day in the Navy, well, a couple of things happened. Bob's Navy assignment, by sheer chance, was the White House. He was some kind of communications officer or something. And one day in the lobby outside of the East Wing, the Oval Office, he, outside the Oval Office, he met this rather nondescript guy in a gray suit. And this guy introduced himself as Mark Felt, the number two guy at the FBI. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to you, here's what will. Mark Felt later became the famous Watergate source, Deep Throat. Mark Felt's identity was protected by Woodward and Bernstein and Bradley and Catherine Graham and Mark Felt for more than 40 years. Nobody knew. And uh, you know, everybody who's cynical about journalism and say, oh yeah, we, we break promises all the time, we didn't break that promise. Bob promised Mark Felt that his identity would be safe, his career would be safe, and it worked out that way. But Bob one day was just not having it anymore, and he called his father in Chicago and said, Dad, I don't want to do this. I want to be a reporter. And his father said, you're crazy, and when you stop being crazy, call me and we'll do the Harvard thing and the, all that. Well, Bob never called back. <laughs> He's not about that. He went to work for the Montgomery County Sentinel, right here in the suburbs, where he covered the usual run of local news, and he spent every waking hour just about bugging, bugging, bugging the Post for a job, and they finally hired him three months before the Watergate break. Oh Meanwhile, Carl Bernstein, OMG, as the kids say today, <laughs> Carl, 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 
Carl grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland. He went to Blair High School with the likes of Goldie Hawn and Ben Stein. And Carl, let's just say delicately, was not much of a student. And let's say even less delicately, Carl had, and still has, an abiding fascination for that half of the population known as women. Carl is a ladies' man for sure. Carl is a party animal for sure. <laughs> Carl, here's what Carl used to do. He was, I, I lent him $5 my first week at the post. You think I'll ever see it? Carl used to go, all of you go way back to the 60s. You remember when the Shah of Iran was in charge of that country and their, their embassy right over here on Mass Avenue, down the hill a little bit, uh, where uh, as you come up the hill, uh, Winston Churchill statues on the left, the, Iran the Iranian embassy was legendary for throwing the greatest parties in town. So Carl would show up at the door, uninvited. He would flash his press card, and all, all hell would break loose. Oh, Mr. Bernstein, please come this way. Would you like some roast beef? Would you like some 35-year-old scotch, Mr. Bernstein? Come right this way. And Carl would eat and drink his fill for nothing. And then he'd remember an important appointment, and he would leave. He would do this over and over and over. And Meanwhile, I, I, Carl's character, you know, I'd been at the post about five minutes and Carl and I both discovered that we had this affection for folk music. And this is at, in, in the fall when the Smithsonian is running its annual uh, folk life festival down on the mall. And they always kick it off with a set piece concert at the departmental auditorium, for those of you who know it's down, downtown off of Constitution Avenue. So Carl said to me, let's get some dates, that's how he phrased it, and go to the concert. I said, fine. So the four of us met, and we were walking down 15th Street. It's a beautiful fall night in Washington. You know, one of those nights that make you glad to be here. We get to the concert. We sit down. We've been sitting in a hall for about two and a half minutes, and Carl jumps up, says to me only, come on backstage. There's somebody I want you to meet. So I said, fine. And we go backstage, and it's the usual scene of open guitar cases and coffee cups everywhere, people tuning up. And so I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and waiting, waiting. He's not introducing me to anybody. And it takes me just a couple of minutes to realize that Carl is back there cruising for additional female talent, even though he has a date waiting in the hall. That's Carl. And so too is this. Carl was such a party boy that he almost got fired just a couple of months before Watergate. Bradley had a lunch date with the mayor of Washington, Walter E. Washington, for those of you who go way back. And the district building downtown, the mayor's office was on the top floor, and so too was the press room. So Bradley came up on the elevator and he said, I think before I jump in to see the mayor, I'll, I'll just say hello to Bernstein. It's, you know, it's one o'clock in the afternoon. He goes in the press room. Carl is asleep on the couch. Not a great career move, Carl. Not great. But the next one might have been even less great. Uh, just a few weeks before Watergate, Carl got sent on an assignment to Cleveland, Ohio, a one-day shot. He goes to Cleveland. He files his story, and he comes home. Nobody thinks anything of it. Life goes on. One month later, just before the Watergate break, the manager of the Hertz rent-a-car outfit at the Cleveland airport calls Bradley. Is Mr. Bernstein planning to return the car he rented one month ago? The meter has been running for one whole month. Well, Bradley, you may know, was in the United States Navy in World War II in the Pacific on a PT boat. And he got to be very friendly with another guy from Massachusetts and Harvard who also was a lieutenant on a PT boat in the Pacific. You know this guy, John F. Kennedy. 
And these two people were friends for the rest of their lives, and they were neighbors in Georgetown, right down the street there. Bradley always said that the main value he always saw from his time in the Navy was that he learned how to curse for two consecutive minutes without repeating himself. <laughs> Try it sometime, gang. You will flame out after 20 seconds, I'm sure. So Bradley comes bursting out of his office, and it's like a bad movie. They're holding him back, and he's reaching over somebody's shoulder, and he, he gave Carl the whole two minutes. Some, by some accounts, it was two minutes and 20 seconds. And he wanted to fire him right on the spot and some other people. No, no, he's got so much potential, man. Don't fire him. Don't fire him. So Bradley said, okay, Bernstein, one last chance. The Watergate break-in happened just a couple of weeks later. So if I'm not the luckiest duck who ever quacked because of my job interview story, I think Carl might. But the key person in all of that golden era at the Washington Post was the woman I mentioned earlier, Catherine Green. And for those of you who don't know her story, uh, wow. Her father, Eugene Meyer, bought the Washington Post at auction in the 1930s. And uh, he had come to Washington with his family to be part of FDR's brain trust. He was a Wall Street money guy. And just for something to do, I guess he found the proverbial quarters in the cushions and the sofa, he bought the Washington Post. And the joke at the time, not much of a joke, was that it was the fifth newspaper in a four newspaper town. It was not much. The Star was better, the Times Herald was better, the Daily News was better, lots were better. But he gave the paper not to his daughter Catherine, but to her new husband, a young guy named Philip L. Graham. Why did that happen? Because men ran the world in the 1930s, and women did not object and did not expect this to be any different. And Catherine Graham did what was expected of her. She kept the big mansion in, on our street in Georgetown. She had one, two, three, four babies right in a row. She belonged to all the right clubs and boards and all that stuff. She had dinner parties when she needed to. She never thought she would become Catherine Graham in capital letters. And then one day in 1963, her husband committed suicide. And Catherine Graham had a decision to make. Would she run this newspaper herself, although she had no experience whatsoever? Would she sell it? Would she run it, uh, sort of, but with lots of help? And all of her advisors, uh, all of the men, of course, said, you can't do this, you can't possibly do this. And she said, watch me. And Catherine Graham became a legend. Catherine Graham was often accused of being the most powerful woman in the world, and she hated that. And she would say, you know, what about Golda Meir? What about Indira Gandhi? And what about Margaret Thatcher? But in her own way, she was as tough as any of them. She stood up to the Nixon administration, first during the Pentagon Papers, when uh, the Nixon administration wanted to preempt the Times, the Post, and the Boston Globe from publishing this study of US involvement in Vietnam. And then just several months later, it happened again with Watergate. The Nixon administration did not want the Post to keep harping on this story, and it did with her encouragement. This woman was as tough as anybody I have ever seen. She was also really good at business. And in her at the time from 1963 to the Post's high mark in the late 1980s, those 25 years, she took this little some sleepy southern town newspaper and built it into a colossus, the center of a Fortune 500 company, a multi-million dollar newspaper. It was a smash hit. But I want to tell you two Catherine Graham stories involving me because it'll give you another view of who this woman really was. She was so many people rolled into one, but, oh man. 1990. Some of you may remember this. Uh, Giant Food was by a mile the largest advertiser in the Post. 
Remember? You'd get to about page A6 every day, and the, the next 10 pages would be artichoke specials and coupons. And in those days, Giant was spending about $14 million a year on advertising in the Post. And as they like to say these days, in today's dollars, that would be about $100 million a year. That's big money. <laughs> Nobody ever said to me, go easy on Giant, but you know, you didn't want to be stupid. So in about 1990, a lot of you will remember this, that Giant and also Safeway was running a promotion. You could bundle your grocery receipts and maybe get some neighbors together, take them into your neighborhood Giant, and they would redeem them for a voucher that would get computer equipment for your kid's school. Anybody remember this? Yeah? So Mr. Genius here <laughs> found out about this, and uh, with my million readers every morning, I said, hey, what if I invite all of my readers to send all of their receipts to me? Then we could really have a party here. We could put a whole ton of receipts together and get a whole computer lab for a school in Southeast Washington that doesn't have anything. So I did this for four years. And it's a measure of where the post was some 35 years ago, that in two of those four years, I collected more than $20 million worth of giant receipts. Whoa. The post owned this town. So one day I get ready to do it again, and my phone rings, and it's a guy I don't know who introduces himself as some new vice president at Giant Food. And this guy starts screaming at me. <clears throat> Bob Levy, you have to stop doing this right now. Bob Levy, don't you know that the whole point of this program is that no one will ever redeem these receipts? Bob Levy, do you want me to call Catherine Brain right now? Do you know that we spend $14 million a year on your newspaper? I love it when they call it my newspaper. <laughs> if it were my newspaper, folks, I wouldn't be with you today. I'd be on my private island in the Bahamas somewhere. Anyway, he just went on and on, and finally, I think we hung up at the same time. And I remember looking at the photo on my, above my desk of Jane and the kids, and thinking, oh man, you've really done it this time. Six minutes later, the phone rings again. It's a woman with a very deep voice that I recognized right away. Bob, it's Okay, said Catherine Graham. Bob, what's this about giant food? I told her. Catherine Graham said, Bob, I'll take care of it. And I never heard another word. Catherine Graham stood in the schoolhouse door against her largest advertiser on behalf of one guy, me. Wow, I still am just absolutely knocked out by that, and uh, so too are everybody in my family because we were able to keep on buying groceries for a while, <laughs> even though it didn't look good there for a minute. Catherine Graham used to say that her job was to build the sandbox, put sand in it, and then say to all of us, go play. But what this story says is that she also had our backs when the chips were down in a way that many, many publishers would not have. And many publishers would not have the human element that she showed me in 1997. Gosh, is this, it really is. 27 years ago. Just another day, I'm finishing up at the office. I'm walking to the Red Line stop at Farragut North to go home to Jane and the kids. I'm crossing 17th Street on L Street. Can you picture it, anybody who's a downtown? Yeah. I'm halfway across 17th Street. It's a nice spring day. And all of a sudden, I couldn't breathe. I staggered across the street. I had no idea what was going on. I grabbed onto one of those newspaper boxes that used to be on the corner. It was a Washington Times box, if you must know. And I'm holding on, I'm dizzy, and I'm sweating, and all these people are there. Are you okay? Are you okay? 
You know how people say, are you okay, hoping that you'll say that you're okay? I didn't know if I was okay, I hoped so. But after a couple of minutes I felt all right, and I got on the subway and went home. And there's Jane, and I said, the strangest thing just happened to me downtown, and I told her what had happened. Now, can we agree, ladies and gentlemen, that the most stubborn creature in the whole world is an adult male? Can we agree? Yeah? Jane said, you're going to the hospital right now. You're going to the doctor right now. What did I say? Ah, oh, no, I gotta go to Chicago in the morning. I'll do it after I got home. <laughs> Let's just say that Jane and I had a vigorous disagreement the rest of that evening about my plans to go to Chicago the next day. Then I went to Chicago the next day, and apparently I'm still here. I came home, and then I had to have emergency heart surgery right away. Yeah. For those of you who don't know how the heart works, every time it beats, flaps open and close, and my flaps weren't flapping, and I was on the verge of death. So I had the heart surgery, and in those days, it was nowhere near as advanced as it is today. Uh, you had to stay at home to recover for six weeks. Oh. Well, I think you know from 40 minutes with me that I'm a big type A energy guy. See what that coffee will do for you? Six weeks at home with a cat was not my idea of a good time. But I did it, and I have to admit, though, that I cheated. Because the health section of the Post asked me to do a cover piece about what it's like to recover from heart surgery, and I did the piece. <laughs> The cover illustration showed a man sitting in a chair with ropes around his chest. And that was pretty much it. But So finally six weeks are done. It's another Monday morning. It's time to go to work. I really couldn't wait. And I said, I know there's going to be a lot of stuff waiting for me. And uh, I got to work that day at 6 a.m. There's nothing happening at the Washington Post at 6 a.m. There's nobody there. The cleaning crew is gone home. Everybody. So I started in on my work, I'm pitching in. Just a few minutes later, it was about 6.15 a.m., I become aware of footsteps behind me. And I whirl around, 6.15 in the morning. It's Catherine Graham and her son Don, who succeeded her as publisher and president of the company. She said, just wanted to see how you're doing. I will never forget that moment. I will never forget her. I hope that all of you had as complicated, as talented, as dedicated a boss. I had one, and I cherish that, and I cherish her. So the golden era was very golden, folks, and I had a wonderful run there. And I decided a few years ago that I really needed to do a memoir of these days because there was so much to, to commemorate and so much that's going to be lost if I didn't write it down. And I started to do a conventional memoir, but it wasn't quite working. And finally I said, what if I do a novel that is very realistic, which evokes those days, and which also uh, connects the, the, the world of downtown journalism to my other fascination, which is politics. And so I have done this book, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it if I can. The book is called Larry Felder Candidate, and it's the story of a famous Washington columnist, fictional, who decides to abandon journalism to run for Congress in the 8th District of Maryland which begins about two miles from here, where Jane and I happen to live. And Larry Felder's story gets so complicated by corruption and the unexpected and love and all kinds of things, but I will tell you that the good guys win in the end. This book is all about what I've just been talking about. It's gotten lots of nice reviews, I'm happy to say. But the review that I care about the most and really enjoyed the most <laughs> came from none other than Jamie Raskin, who actually does represent the 8th <laughs> District of Maryland in Congress. And Jamie bought the book, read the book, thank you, Jamie, and he said, I'm just glad I never had to run again. 
against either Larry Felder or Bob Lee. <laughs> Raskin, you know, if this politics thing doesn't work out for him, he could be a late night comedian. He just has the touch. <clears throat> anyway, the book is available for sale here. There is Jane ready to uh, sign you up, cash, check, credit card. When I'm done, I'll be there to sign copies and uh, happy to sign any way you like. Uh, I think this would be a real nice book for your library, but also as a gift if you want to uh, give it to somebody who cares about these things. Okay, a number of you came up to me ahead of time and said, oh, so Larry Felder is you, huh? No, he's not. I am not Larry, and Larry is not me. There are certain obvious similarities. We both grew up in the Bronx. Yes, I survived. And uh, we both started on small newspapers and came to a bigger one in Washington, but there the similarities end. Uh, I love to think that uh, Larry, as I build him in this book, uh, has nothing to do with me because he's not a very cool guy, and I like to think that I'm cooler than Larry is. Larry has particular trouble with the female of the species. One night in one of his early uh, newspaper jobs in White Plains, New York, some young lady says to him, uh, who's on the staff, why don't you come and visit me over the weekend and don't make any other plans? Mm. And Larry says to her in the book, well, I need a change of clothes. <laughs> and later when he's getting going with the woman who becomes his wife in the book, she says to him, Larry, when I'm with you, you make something in my in my heart go pitter pat. I I feel feel it for you, Larry. And Larry, misreading the moment totally, offers her a tons. <laughs> I haven't been single in a very very long time, ladies and gentlemen. But I love to think I would have been cooler than Larry in both of those situations. Anyway, the book is available. Happy to see you over there when we're done. But I want to end tonight and uh, today by telling you a little bit about what I've been up to since a very memorable afternoon a little over 20 years ago. In 1995, uh, the Post first became aware of something called the Internet. I think history will not be kind to the Post and other major newspapers for not seeing immediately what a threat this was because it instantly became an existential threat. By late 2003, just eight years later, I think it's fair to say the Post was in danger of failing. The entire advertising base had gone away, circulation was beginning to drop, young people were not finding and buying or subscribing to the Post, death spiraled. But still, we were publishing a lot of newspapers every day. Still, we were honored and respected. Still, we continued to be the number one news operation in the metropolitan area. And then one day in December of 2003, just another day writing just another column, guy walks into my office with a huge stack of papers and drops it on my desk and says, you better read this. The first buyout offer under the Graham family. There have been six now. But this was the first, and 154 of us were bought out on the same day at the end of December 2003. Uh, I've been at the Post for more than uh, 36 years at that point. Uh, unbelievable. We had one in college, we had another one about to go to college. This just could not have landed at a worse time. And we discussed it, and we decided to take this thing. And who knew what was going to be next? I had no idea what would be next. I did know immediately what would be next, and that was the goodbye party for all 154 of us. One mass goodbye party. That party may still be going on, actually. <laughs> alcohol, tears, more alcohol, more tears. Most of us are still alive. Most of us are, have gone on to other things. I was done with journalism. I was sure I was done with it. How could I hope to duplicate what I had? So I went on, got another job, and I'm happy to say that in the years since, I have uh, 
been a professor at six universities. I have run two nonprofit organizations. I've done Larry Felder Candidate and other books. I've been a consultant. I've been, a, oh, I've been doing so many things. But I was into my next life. I said bye-bye post, and then one day the phone rings. I've been gone three weeks or something. It's the obituary editor at the Post, a guy I knew. I said, hey, hi, good to hear from you, but uh, why are you calling? I, I, I haven't been looking so good lately. And he said, no, no, nothing like that. And he said, the night before, this is 20 years ago, okay, the night before, Jimmy Carter had been rushed to a hospital in Plains, Georgia. As you know, he's still alive. <laughs> And they looked in the file and they discovered they had absolutely nothing ready to go on a former president of the United States. Not cool at all. So the obituary editor says to me, I found some money and I want to hire you, meaning me and a couple of other fossils, <laughs> that's what he said, thank you, to do advanced obituaries about famous people in politics, sports, media, business, would I be interested? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. I've been doing it ever since. Across almost 20 years now, I've done about 45 of these, and in some ways it's been the most fascinating assignment I've ever had. <laughs> it's so fluky, you know, you never know when somebody's gonna die, you never know why somebody is gonna die, but you got to be ready in case that moment comes. So here are the rules. They assign me to all the obituaries I do. I don't ask because I can't. I have not done Donald Trump. I have not done myself. <laughs> I've done a lot of people you've definitely heard of. The most recent one of mine who died was Willard Scott, the, uh, the famous weatherman on the Today Show, the guy who did the 100th birthdays. And, the original Ronald McDonald, did you know that? And before that, he was the weatherman on Channel 4 here, all around great guy, and what a wonderful subject for an obituary. But, in the middle of this 20 years, there was an eight year period, eight years, where none of mine died. <laughs> and our daughter wanted to get me a t-shirt that said, if you want to live forever, have Levy do your obituary. <laughs> and she was just about to get this uh, this T-shirt, and wouldn't you know it, the next week two of mine died. You know how how people view their own deaths. I want to end on this story because this one still absolutely blows my mind. I am not going to tell you who this person is because he's still alive, but you know this guy. He's really famous. And I went downtown to interview him for an hour and a half. Uh, sometimes so that goes well, sometimes it doesn't go well. This was fine, we, we, we were really connecting. So I'm done and I got one arm in my coat and I'm getting ready to leave. And this very famous person looks at me and says, I just want to do one favor, okay? I said, yeah. He said, please don't mention my first wife in the obituary. I said, what? You were married for 30 years, <clears throat> you had children together. She ran all of your political campaigns. She raised all the money for your political campaigns. And before you ran away with a 30 years younger campaign manager and married her and unmarried the first one, she was really central to your life, wasn't she? Well, yeah, but I just don't feel good about having her in my obituary. Well, yes, I pointed out to this guy that he would be too dead to read <laughs> the obituary. So it's not going to matter to him. So if you've ever seen this, whether you're a man or a woman, when two men face off like this, it's like mastodon and mastodon. I'm not going to give in. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. So we kind of looked at each other, glared at each other, and finally he gave in. How could he not? It's my newspaper and my open. So I'm here to say, folks, that sometimes truth, justice, the American way works. When this guy goes, his first wife will be there. Yes.
Folks, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take your questions now about absolutely anything at all. And again, once we're done with the questions, I will be back there with Jane to sell and sign books. Yes, ma'am. What did Carl do with the car? Yeah, you know. Yes, he left it at the airport, but he forgot to check it out with the Hertz rental car people. It was sitting in the parking lot for one whole month. Meter running. Real good move. I don't, I don't remember what the tab was, but it was a lot. Yes, sir. Big apparent? No. Yes, sir. My question is, so what do you think about the future of the post these days? I think it's very different and very limited. I think if you're asking me, sir, whether the print newspaper is going to survive, the answer is maybe as long as Jeff Bezos wants to incubate it and keep it afloat. If it had to survive in the market on its own, it would have been dead a long time ago. There are no ads there. The circulation is about 20% of what it used to be right now today, 20%. That's not a business that survives. However, uh, the digital side is doing somewhat better, uh, and, but then however upon however, the Post lost $100 million in 2023. $100 million. Even for Jeff Bezos, that's a lot of money. How did that happen? They assumed that the huge surge of digital subscribers that arrived when Donald Trump arrived uh, would continue. When Donald Trump left, it dropped precipitously from three million down to about one and a half million right away, and it's still about one and a half million. Even the digital post is marginally profitable, but not big time. What's gonna happen? <sighs> They're going to have to find a way to add value to the post in the way that the New York Times has done. The New York Times, for those of you who don't know this, has acquired Wordle. Do you know what Wordle is? With some nods here. Do you know what wire cutter is? Anybody know? Okay. I'm not sure I know. <laughs> but it's another uh, Generation X aimed uh, sidecar business. So you don't just get the news, you get Wordle, you get wire cutter, you now get a sports site called The Athletic. You get a bundle of things. And today you don't get that bundle. The post. So that alone may be a way to survive, but oh man, it is bad, bad, bad out there and going to get worse. More questions, folks? Sorry, yes, ma'am. <laughs> what, what do you think of the quality of the writing uh, with AI bots? <laughs> you know how to hurt a guy, don't you? <laughs> AI could be the end of every journalist in the world. That's not an exaggeration. If the market is willing to settle for 90% of what a human could have done, if the world is willing to overlook the weirdness of some of the, of the AI-produced words, and the world might be willing to do that. Don't forget that we now live in a world where people think they can get a full taste of any story on X formerly Twitter. We have people who think that they are thoroughly informed by looking at their Instagram feed and seeing whatever their friends sent them. We've got young people walking around through life with a phone in their faces, and that's all they ever see, do, or think about. This is really, really bad. And if those young people say that AI is enough for them, there won't be journalism of the kind we're talking about. Nobody will miss it because a lot of it will be free and a lot of it will be ubiquitous. And they won't have to say, oh, look at me. I'm reading the New York Times. I'm reading the gold standard of foreign correspondence. They're not even going to know what foreign correspondence is. So it's not just that AI is never quite the same as a human being would do. It is also that you don't get the nuance on an extremely difficult story that a human will give you. I mean, let's look for just one example at the war in the Middle East, and now five months old. I don't think AI could do justice to that story. It's the most complicated, difficult story in the world right now. 
you need to invest time and chew leather to understand it. And you need to have people covering it who will do it as fairly as they can and as roundaboutly as they can. And I'm sorry, AI can't do it. Now, I know I'm old. I take a look at my hair. I know I'm old. I would much prefer to have a human give me that nuance. But I think in 50 years, you won't be asking that question. I think AI will have taken over. I'm worried about it. And you should be, too. More questions on that cheerful note? I, I might disagree with you about the AI thing. Go ahead. Uh, so I have a question afterwards. But I think that it is so poorly put together that you need somebody to edit it. You, and my husband has said this to me when he's doing stories, like he could put all of this stuff into the AI chat box and then unfortunately he comes back with this mess that he has to sort through. Uh, so I think human beings are not going to be you know, obsolete. Well, I hope you're right, Aaron, but what if I said to you that another computer can be hired and programmed <laughs> to do that editing of the AI work? You know that's coming. And that's not an issue. Sh- I mean, he, your husband is right, right this minute. He's not going to be right for very long. Uh, yes, sir. One final question, then. and if you have one that we didn't get to, come on and chase me up here in, in Bookland. Yes, sir. You had mentioned the Pentagon Papers. Yeah. Um, how would you compare that with, say, Julian Assange and the recent uh, fellow that was put in jail for releasing Trump's taxes? An excellent question. And this really didn't attract a whole lot of attention at the time. Uh, I think any time you steal something from the federal government and fence it to media without authorization and knowing full well that you're breaking the law, that that has to be taken into account. Uh, I don't know that if Ellsberg did that today, some 50 years later, that he would not be prosecuted for it right away. And it wouldn't just be a question of prior restraint of publishing. It would be a question of, did this guy break the law? He was charged with that. You may remember the how that played out. He went to trial, and there was a hung jury, and the Justice Department decided not to try him a second time. He got lucky. He got a juror who didn't buy it. Uh, if you're asking for my own opinion, I think the right result happened the wrong way there. Uh, I'm not a big fan of thieves, and uh, I've never dealt with thieves in my career, and I would have been very reluctant to accept something that had been stolen and Xeroxed. Uh, I would have wondered about ulterior motives. I would have wondered about being criminally liable myself. Uh, there are lots of parts of the Pentagon paper story that are comparable to the Julian Assange idea, and to that kid up in Massachusetts who helped himself to all that stuff from the web. Good question, thank you. You're the final question. What can we do about this lack of newspapers and the down spiral? I mean, can we support newspapers? We can support them, and as you know, uh, There's a very interesting initiative that is about to be introduced in the D.C. Council. We were talking about it before we got started. A councilwoman from uh, Ward 4, which is the northern part of 16th Street, is about to introduce a bill that would give $25 debit cards to anybody who wants them, paid for by your taxes, redeemable only via news site either the post, print newspapers, electronic, whatever. But this would at least incubate the habit. And it would at least get people in the door when they now today don't go anywhere near the door. I'm really interested in this. And I think this has some potential. Even though uh, taxpayers aren't going to love this uniformly, it's not a whole lot of money. And it could make a whole lot of difference between living and death, particularly for startups and particularly for new voices and different voices and for voices of uh, underrepresented groups. So we'll wait and see. What's her name? Her name is Janice Lewis George. She's the council member from Ward 4. This is on her website, I believe, if you want to take a look. I'm fascinated by this because no other prescription that I've seen or read or know about has ever tried to solve this issue that way. A lot of people say, oh, well, 
it'll take care of itself. When today's 19 year olds realize they gotta know more about the world, then they'll gravitate toward the New York Times. Ain't happening. It ain't happening. And it ain't gonna happen because the web is free and it's without any constraints at all. So thank you for that question. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again. Thank you for being here.